many, most of you know that um, prior to planting this church, my wife and I had been uh, youth pastors for many years. And one of the most fun events we ever participated in uh, was a mud bowl. Yeah, we loaded up a van load of our youth, and we drove over to Alpen Rose Dairy, where we met up with hundreds of other youth. And what they had done is where the big, you know, the arena that's there, they'd scooped out a deep, you know, trench, probably about the size of this whole space. They'd scooped it out and then brought in fresh, sifted dirt up to a depth of probably two, if not three feet deep in this gully that they, you know, trenched out of there. And then they turned a fire hose on it and turned it into a soupy, messy wonderland. We had so much fun, all the activities, all the games. I mean, we never forgot that. But, you know, how in the world do you get hundreds of youth who now have to get back into their various church vans and buses home now that they've got mud stuffed virtually everywhere? Hey, what do you do? Fire hose. That's what they did, man. They say, all right, come on. You know, and they've got a guy over here, over here on the grass. And there's a guy. And they'd line up the kids. And then a guy would just flip the switch. Yeah, I flip this lever on this fire hose and just from about this far away, just, just blast you. I got a question. How many of you have ever been blasted from about 10 feet away, right in the face, with a fire hose. You've not lived until that's happened. I think my eyeball was plastered back in the back of my skull that day. But I'll tell you, man, it worked. All he did, he just flipped the lever and it began to gush. And you know, this last week we talked about how God is our provision. God is our provider. But how do we begin to flip the switch on his provision so it comes gushing out? Steve talked about when he gave that word how God wants to provide in virtually every area of your life. In Philippians, it says, my God will meet what? Would you say that with me? My God will meet all your needs. Do you ever have needs that are physical? Okay, does that mean he can meet those needs? How about uh, spiritual? Absolutely. Financial? emotional, relational, my God will supply all of your needs. Now, we want to believe that. But like I talked about, some of us, we've taken this, the, the face of maybe our earthly experience, whether it be our parent or whatever, and we place that on God, and we have a hard time believing that God's really capable of meeting all our needs. Now, I have a question for you. Are there things that we can do in our life that kind of shut off or restrict the flow of God's provision in our lives? Is that true? Can we do that? Yes. And likewise, there's things that we can do that help flip the switch, so to speak, so that his blessing, so that, so that his provision can be released. So if you take a look at your outline, I want to talk with you about how God's provision is released. Now, I'm going to ask Steve, can you come on up here? And if you can go ahead and fill in your first blank, God's provision is released by what? By faith. Now, come on up here, Steve. I have a question for you. Do you have faith that this chair is capable of holding you? You do. So, Steve, this is essentially what faith is. He has confidence that he's going to sit in this chair and it's going to hold him. And so now he's going to take this faith and he's going to put some action to it. Okay, right there. And voila, it worked. There's, there's faith, faith in effect right there. Good job. Now, Steve, notice I didn't ask you to sit in this chair. This chair takes a much higher level of faith to sit in than that chair. And everybody said what? Amen. Give a hand to Steve. Now, I kind of had an epiphany this morning because uh, 
Jesus said something interesting about your faith. He said, if you just have faith as small as a mustard seed, that seems like small faith, right? If you, but if your faith is, you know, just the size of a mustard seed, which is the smallest seed in the garden. He says, if you just have faith that big, you can say to this mountain, move here from uh, to there, and it will. Nothing will be impossible for you. And so, Steve, it didn't require much faith for you to sit in this chair because this chair is clearly strong. It's stout. You look at it, there's a lot of confidence for you to just sit down there. But on this one, on the other hand, it takes a little more evaluation and, gee, what's my weight compared to what I think this chair can hold? And there's a lot more reservation involved here. This takes more. The point that I want to make is this. Listen, you guys, God is strong. God is capable. God is able. That's why he says even if your faith is just the size of a mustard seed, you can confidently come to God and trust that he's able to care for you and to carry you. Amen? Let's give him an applause for that. Now, one of my favorite verses is in Hebrews. It's Hebrews 11.1. 1. Would you read this with me? Faith is being sure of what we hope for. So let's pause for a moment. Steve, St you know, Steve wants to sit in this chair and not fall down. So when he looks at it, is he sure? Is there a confidence that when he sits in this, it's going to work? Yeah, okay. And then certain of what we do not see. I haven't done it yet. I haven't seen it yet. But there's enough confidence there that I'm going to freely plop down there and know that it's going to take care of me. Faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Now, in a few weeks... Uh, for us, um, Thanksgiving, that's the time where we get our family together. We gather around the table. Now, Thanksgiving this year has not come yet, but I have confidence, I have faith that is coming. I'm already anticipating what's going to be there. There's going to be a turkey dinner. There's going to be gravy. There's going to be probably mashed potatoes. Uh, there's going to be my wife's famous green bean casserole. So good. In fact, I'm so confident that that day's coming, and there's going to be a spread there that I'm already getting hungry just talking about it. And then what about the pumpkin pie? Whoa, yes, the pumpkin pie I love smothered in whipped topping, right? You don't put ice cream on your pumpkin pie, although that's always a good option. That should be there. But, but we like to just smother, and, of course, Grandma's famous French apple pie. Absolutely. So I haven't seen it yet. I haven't touched it. I haven't sank my teeth into it. The date of the calendar has not arrived yet, but I'm fully confident that day is coming. I've already, you know, scheduled it. I'm going to be there, and I'm going to be ready for that. This is a level of faith. This is what it boils down to. Faith is being sure of what we hope for and confident of what we have not seen yet. Faith is a firm persuasion and expectation that God will perform all that he has promised. So what are some of the things that God has promised? He's promised that he will forgive us of our sins. He's promised us eternal life. I mean, we could go through, and there are so many promises there. And even though you've not experienced eternal life yet. You're not living forever. I mean, you're not in heaven yet, but you're showing up here and you're saying yes to Christ because there's confidence in your heart that day is coming. And you live your life as if you fully believe it's coming. Amen? And so he's called us to live this life of faith. And so that's the first thing, that God's provision is released through faith. In fact, it says in the Bible that faith, that, that without faith, it's impossible to please God. In another place, it says this. Go ahead and put the next one up there. It says, faith without deeds, faith without what? Action is dead. Steve could come up here and say, yes, I've got full faith that that chair would hold me. But unless he sits in it, his words don't mean anything. Are you with me? 
your faith must be backed up by what you do. Now, there's a story in the Bible that really illustrates this powerfully, the story of Abraham. Now, Abraham had been given a promise by God that his descendants would be like the stars of the sky, numerous. They'd be like the sands of the seashore. There'd be so many, wouldn't even be able to count them all. But there was a big problem with this promise. He was 100 years old, and his wife was 90 years old, and she was barren. So they didn't have any kids, but he's hanging on to this promise. And God performs a miracle. His wife conceives. She gives birth to Isaac. And so now here's this son of promise, this heir that's able to help take this family line and move it forward. Now here's Isaac. He's kind of growing up. He's a young boy. And now God speaks to Abraham. He says, I want you to take your son, your one and only son, and I want you to go up to the mountain to the place where I will show you. And I want you to offer your son as a burnt offering unto me. Now, I know when we hear that here, that just kind of blows our mind. That's a hard one to get our minds around. And I'm sure it wasn't that easy for Abraham either. He must have been thinking, wait a minute. I've waited 100 years for this descendant to come. You've given me this promise that through my line, my descendants will be like the sands of the seashore. And now you're calling me to take my one and only descendant and offer him up as a burnt sacrifice? Makes no sense. But the Bible tells us early the next morning that he arose and he gathered the wood together. And he and his young son headed out to the mountain, to the place where God would show them. In fact, Isaac is carrying the firewood. Abraham's carrying a knife and carrying the fire. I don't know how he was carrying the fire, but it says he carried the fire. And they go up this mountain to the place where the Lord had shown them. And I can imagine Isaac was a little bit nervous when he asks the question as he's looking around. And he says, Dad, I, I see the wood. I see the knife. I see the fire. Where's the lamb? <laughs> and Abraham says, my son, God will provide. God will provide. Now, he didn't know how God was going to provide. He didn't know what God was going to do. But the Bible tells us he now binds his son up and places him on top of this altar. And he actually raises the knife. And then the angel of the Lord called out. It called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, do not lay a hand on that boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear the Lord because you have not withheld anything from me, not even your son, your only son. I want you to imagine that essentially what happened was Abraham's faith uh, triggered God's provision. Because while they're marching up the mountain, just trying to follow God, God's already at work planting his provision by that ram being stuck in the thickets. Now, how many of you know God knew exactly what he was going to do, right? Abraham didn't. Abraham had no idea. He didn't know what God was going to do. He just knew he was going to trust God. And so his faith and obedience preceded God's provision. The point that I'm making is often we sit back and we're, we're waiting for the provision before we trust God. But God says, no, you trust me first. You put your faith into action first, and then the provision comes. It goes on in Genesis. It says, because you've done this, and you've not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sands on the seashore. And through your offspring, uh, through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed. Read the underline with me. Because what? Go ahead and say that again. Because what? See, often God's provision is being prepared behind the scenes. It's not out of his view, but it is out of your view. And it's hard often for us to lay down 
our Isaac, so to speak, because we're busy trying to figure out how it's all going to work out. But how many of you know you can't figure out how it's all going to work out? God knows you don't. Your step is trust God, follow God. Now, I would never uh, put a house anywhere near on the level of what um, Abraham went through here, but it's our story, so I'll, I'll share that with you. Uh, the home that we have in Gresham, I mean, it was our home. We bought the lot. We went over there one day and cleared the lot, and knocked down trees, and got it ready. And for the next seven or eight months, friends and family, my wife and I, we worked with our own hands and built this home. It's a home where I was raising my kids in. We loved our home. And then all of a sudden, God says, hey, I want you to go up that mountain there to the place I'll show you. Well, really what he was saying was, I want you to move 3,000 miles away. I want you to put your little Isaac on the altar. It's like, Lord, this, he says, you trust me in this. I'm your provision. And that was a hard move for us, you know, because it wasn't just the house. We packed up everything we owned. We kissed our family goodbye. We loaded everything, everything we owned, went into a moving truck and a for sale sign, went in the front yard, and we were going to a place we were not familiar with because God was calling us to a season of ministry. Now, did we know that ministry season would only be six months? We had no idea. We had no idea. We get there three months into it. We're in the middle of youth camps, and we discover the office that we're working in, that they were going to be shutting it down, that the job we went out there to do was going to cease to exist. But listen what ends up happening. We trusted God. We knew God had put this church in our heart. We hadn't planted it yet. We didn't even know where we were going to plant it. We thought maybe we'd be starting this church on the East Coast. That's what we thought. But as we put our Isaac on the altar, we put a for sale sign in our front yard for six months, and we moved away. And it, it was as if the angel of the Lord put not for sale over our house. Because three months into this, just to test if this was truly the Lord calling us here to start the church, we had the uh, realtor lower the price on the house. Still, no takers whatsoever. And this here was an amazing miracle. We go there. We work six months. They give us a year and a half of severance. What did we need to start this church? We needed a year and a half of severance. We needed the ability to not concern ourselves with finances, but to have that covered so we could pour everything we had into planting this church. But I'll tell you what, that would have never been released had Isaac not been put on the altar, our Isaac, and we went ahead and went to the place that the Lord was showing us. We had no idea behind the scenes that God was working out provision for this. I think we need to give the Lord applause for that. And I think so often we don't see the stuff coming through because we're busy waiting for it to come through before we're going to trust God and step out. But it doesn't work that way. Life begins at the end of your comfort zone. Why don't you turn to the person next to you and say, life begins at the end of your comfort zone. Oh, by the way, can I also say this? So does God's provision. <laughs> so does his provision. It comes at the end of your comfort zone. Let me continue on here. Here's your next point to fill in there. God's provision is released through obedience. Okay? What did it say? Faith without works is what? Dead. So what if uh, God had called Abraham to lay down Isaac, but he had said, no. Would God still have loved Abraham? Is there anybody in this room, God has called you to something, maybe to lay something down or whatever the case might be, and you've said no. Okay. And the no is simply by you not doing it. It's not that you literally said, no, Lord. You just, your no is you don't do what he's calling you to do. So how many of you have said no to the Lord? They raise them up high. Billy? 
Say, say it isn't so. I am crushed. Now, here's a question for you, Billy. Did he love you any less? No. No, he doesn't. But it certainly can affect what God accomplishes through your life. Now, this was a big deal here for Abraham because did you realize it was through Abraham's descendants that Christ came? Abraham is the father of the Jewish people. That's his descendants right there. And so for him, that obedience was a big deal. And for us, it's a big deal as well. So here's the question. What is God calling you to do? How many of you are feeling impressed that God is calling you to lay down a habit or an addictive thing that you have, that you keep running back to? Raise your hand if that's you. Okay, raise them up high. Okay, so he's calling you to do that. Is God calling you to step out in some area of your life? What is he calling you to do? Now I'm going to challenge you. If you are not faithful to step out and follow God, like Abraham did, to that place he will show you, if you're not willing to step out today, then really you should not expect the open door tomorrow. Because it's the steps you take today that release the provision of God to give you the courage, to give you the power, to get to give what is necessary in your life, to give what's needed there. If we don't handle today properly, how could we possibly be expected that we're going to handle tomorrow properly? What if the freshman in college said, you know, I don't like being a freshman at all. I'm going to just skip class till I'm a senior. Well, guess what? He's never going to be a senior. He's not even going to be a junior or a sophomore. Because for you to be promoted to being a sophomore, what must you first do? You must fulfill what is required of the freshman. And for you to advance forward in what God has for you, you can't just kind of check out. You must do what God has placed in front of you as he's advancing you forward. Forward. See, Abraham is a role model for us. Here was a case where he trusted God, where, where it appeared like there was going to be great loss. But as it turned out in trusting God, it became great gain. Think about that for a moment. You know, like Abraham, you have to determine, ultimately, are you going to trust God to be your provider? Are you going to trust in him to do that? Not just with your finances, but virtually every area of your life. And then there's the last thing I want to talk with you about. And often we, we forget this one. Let's go ahead and put it up there. God's provision is released through what? Persistence. Let me hear you say that one again persistence. You know, when I talk about persistence, I'm talking about that tenacious kind of spirit, like one of Abraham's descendants demonstrated. Remember his grandson, Jacob. And it tells us that Jacob was in a very stressful time. His life was in the crosshairs. And he's going to meet his brother, who he had been estranged from for decades. And it says that his brother was coming after him with 400 men. He didn't know what was going to happen, and he was stressed out. And the Bible tells us that Jacob wrestled with the angel of the Lord, that he was wrestling with God all night long. And it says that the angel told him, it's almost daylight, I must go. But Jacob said, I will not let go until you have blessed me. That's a tenacious spirit. That's a persistent spirit where I will not let go unless you bless me. Now, I can tell you that the value of persistence, that's a theme throughout the Bible. Another story is the story of the Canaanite woman. This is in the New Testament. Now, listen, Jesus loves everybody in the world, right? We know that. But did you know why he was here on earth? His ministry was focused to the lost sheep of Israel. 
Now, after he went to the cross and was resurrected and the Holy Spirit was given and the, the disciples took his message of grace, the gospel, the good news, that was taken to the ends of the earth. But while Jesus was doing his ministry on earth, it was focused on the lost sheep of Israel. So now here's a Canaanite woman. This is not a Jewish woman. She's a foreigner, and she comes to Jesus begging for him to heal her son. And Jesus essentially tells her no, that right now my ministry is focused on the lost sheep of Israel. But listen to her persistence. She says, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. Your request is meant. Now, I got a question for you. Was it really her great faith, or was it her great persistence? Or is great faith backed up by your persistence? If there's something you contend for, you keep contending. You keep fighting. You keep wrestling for it. You keep going for it. I got a question. Has anybody in here been contending for a miracle? Keep contending. Don't give up. You stay persistent. Is there anybody, you've been praying for your kid, your adult children, your adult child that is not living for Christ. You raise them with the foundation, but they've walked away, and you are praying for them. You're praying for their salvation. Anybody? Do you lose a little hope from time to time? I want to challenge you. Stay persistent. You keep praying for them. Do you have a dream? Do you believe there's something God has called you to do and the door hasn't been opened yet and you, you kind of get a little shaky need? You're not so sure? I want you to understand. I love what Tommy Barnett said. He said, dreams uh, delayed are not dreams denied. There are times during this persistence, during this wrestling time where God is doing something in us. Amen? God is at work doing something in us. So this is your job. Your job is to just not throw in the towel. Your job is to keep your eyes firmly fixed on Jesus Christ, the author of your faith. Your job is to keep getting up and keep going for God. Keep contending for what you believe he has called you to do. Amen? That you would stay persistent. I think of the farmer who, uh, you know, he goes and plants his field and he prays for a great harvest as he walks out the door with his hoe, ready to go work the land. It's important. We understand there's that tension, that balance be between praying and going hands off and letting God do his thing, and at the same time, praying and doing the hard work of tilling the soil. Do you understand what I'm saying? There's a persistence thing that has to happen as well. Now, how many of you would raise your hand and say, hey, I've come under the hand of God in trusting him for my salvation? If you said yes to Jesus Christ, throw your hand in the air. Raise him up really high and let me look around here. Look at this, you guys. Look at all of these people in this room that said, yeah, I'm going to come under the hand of God and trust him with my salvation. So you've trusted him with your eternity. Do you believe you'll spend forever with him? Give him an applause for that. So if he says, I will meet all your needs, not just your salvation, all, all your needs. Let me hear you say all. Physical, emotional, relational, financial, spiritual. So the challenge to you is this. If you have crawled under his hand and you've trusted him with eternity, have enough faith to crawl under his hand and trust him with everything else. Amen? Faith, obedience, persistence. It's not that hard to trust a chair built like that. God is not some rickety God. It's like, Ma, I'm not so sure. He is stout. He is strong. He is very capable. And that's why he says, all you need is faith as small as a mustard seed. You'll be moving mountains in my name. 
So you may be coming and saying, oh, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. He will bolster your faith. All you got to do is take the first step and you trust that he's fully capable. He can forgive you of all your sins. He can write your name in the book of life that it will never be erased. Hallelujah. So he says, trust me with that. Take a seat right there, right in my lap. Trust me with that. And then begin to trust me with these other areas. Faith, obedience, faith without works is dead. And then stay persistent. Pray for the harvest. And now grab your hoe and go out and work the land. Amen. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed. The first step I always take here is saying yes to Christ. That's the first step on everything. The very first step with everything is saying yes to Christ. That's the first step. So today, with your heads bowed and our eyes closed, do you need to say yes to him? Maybe you never asked him into your life. Maybe you have, but, you know, you've kind of wandered off, man. You're in the back 40 living your own life. So if that's you, if you want to dedicate or rededicate yourself to the Lord, would you just throw your hand in the air where you're at, and I want to pray with you. Amen. I see your hand, yours, and yours. And in the back, I see yours. Anybody else this morning? Can we pray this prayer together, dear Lord? I say yes. I'm fully confident. You are strong. You are capable. I throw my whole life into your hand. Forgive me of my sin. Come in and fill me with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray.